Well, hello again. In this example, you will see the flexibility approach applied to the solution of a series of axial members. Specifically, it is a series of two members being subjected to a load of 96 kips. If we are only considering the axial direction, then these are the only unknown forces that we have, R1 and R3. What that tells us is that we have two unknown forces. We've made no cuts, so that is one piece. And since we are only considering the axial direction, that means we have summation of forces in the x, that's where that one comes from, just that one equation, times one structural part, tells me that I have one equilibrium equation. And so what that says is I have two unknown forces, subtract off the one equilibrium equation, and I come to the conclusion that I'm statically indeterminate to the first degree. That means I need to select one redundant. And I'm going to select R3 as that redundant. You could just as easily have selected R1 for this. Okay, so step number one is going to be to remove that redundant, R3, and sketch the primary structure, which is what I have here. I'm going to go ahead and sketch what the deflected shape looks like for that. I know that if I've got the 96 kips, this thing is going to deflect, shifting here to the left. And what I am interested in is knowing at location 3 how much we have shifted. Now it's going to take a little bit of effort to get what that deflection is, but let's go ahead and do it by solving for what the internal axial forces are in each of the two members. And the way I would do that is I would make a cut and I would sketch a free body diagram of this. And what I would do is if I made that cut there, I would find out that the internal axial force in bar 1, 2 was equal to negative 96 kips. Then I'd have to come back and I'd have to make a cut in bar 2, 3, sketch a free body diagram, and I would find out that the internal axial force in that bar is 0 kips. So I can actually compute that delta 3 with this particular equation. And this is using the well-known relationship that says delta is equal to NL over AE. So I take the internal axial forces, plug it in, here's the length of the member, the cross-sectional area of the member, modulus of the member. For the member 2, 3, the internal axial is 0, and so when I solve this out, I get delta 3 is equal to a negative 0 0.0284 inches. Okay, now I move on to my redundant structure where I come back here and I apply my unknown redundant force, R3, and I know that my deflected shape is going to look something like this, where I get some kind of a displacement here. So this is the displacement at 3 due to the force being applied at 3. That can be rewritten in terms of the flexibility coefficient multiplied by the force at 3. So what that really means is I am going to eventually need to know that flexibility coefficient, and I will do that by looking at the flexibility structure. The flexibility structure simply says I apply a unit force, and as I get that deflected shape coming out here, this deflection that resulted at 1 due to the unit load at 1 is referred to as that flexibility coefficient. So similar to the way I handled it for the primary structure, I will handle it for the flexibility structure in that I can solve for the internal forces in each of the segments, which happen to be, in this case, 1 and 1. And if you don't see that right away, just go ahead and make a cut in each of the individual members and sketch out a free body diagram, and you should be very quickly able to see that as it comes in. So then F33, I will use that relationship of the NL over AE. So there's the N, 160 inches, 150 inches squared over my E value, plus whatever is happening in bar 2, 3, and that will result in a quantity that's 5.1 9 times 10 to the negative fourth inches per kip that is applied to it. 
With all of that information now available, the sketches and the associated deflections computed, I can then get a compatibility equation put together by looking back at my primary and my redundant structure. I will take the deflections that occur at point 3 and I will add those up so that they equal what it is in the real structure here. So that would take the displacement at 3 coming from the primary structure plus the displacement 3, 3 coming from the redundant structure and all of that is equal to the displacement that is present in the real structure itself. And then this can be rewritten in terms of the flexibility coefficient so it would look like this delta 3 plus F 3 3 times R 3 is equal to 0. Remember that what can happen is you can have more than one degree indeterminacy and thus more than one redundant and so it would probably be good for you to look at these as being vectors and being matrices even though in these cases they're all one by one, recognize that they can be written in matrix form and make it more generic. So now that I've got that I can rewrite this say R3 is equal to 1 over F33 times negative delta 3. Okay so let's go ahead and plug in those numbers. I got this negative, negative 0, 0 0.0284 inches. you recall that that comes from the primary structure. And then I will divide it by the flexibility coefficient, 5.19 times 10 to the negative fourth inches per kip. And this will be equal to 54.9 kips. Now the positive value on this simply tells me that I had assumed the correct direction in my original formulation. And where is it that I assumed the correct direction? It was in the redundant structure. I assumed it was acting to the right, so when I came up with the positive value, it indeed acts to the right. Now all I need to do to finish this up is to run equilibrium to solve for the other unknown. I will go ahead and sum forces in the x direction. R1 minus 96 kips plus 54.9 kips is equal to 0. R1 is equal to 41.1 kips. The positive value tells me I assumed the correct direction, which means it is acting to the right. And that concludes this example. As always, it's a beautiful day for studying structures. Thank you.